Welcome to another edition of the Best Business Minds, where we interview business leaders and academics that write thought-provoking books. I'm Mark Kramer, a serial entrepreneur who consults with family businesses and entrepreneurs. And today, I'm actually in Jakarta, Indonesia, uh, visiting uh, friends here. So um, let's welcome our guest today, Jane Bulwer, author of Worthy. Jane, welcome. Thanks for having me, Mark. Hi. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to have you. So, Jane, let's start off with uh, you talking about your professional background. Well, I got a degree in forestry, which absolutely positioned me for for uh, success at Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I got an undergraduate degree in forestry because really my line of sight was very small, and that was recommended for me that I get that degree. But you know, it wasn't long in the forestry degree that I realized that I was more set out for business and other things. And so ultimately got an MBA, went to work for a CPG company called Kimberly Clark and had just a phenomenal experience there. I got to launch two businesses that are now billion dollar businesses, one of which I wrote the business plan for and persuaded executive management to go forward with. I got to work in Latin America, 16 countries south of Mexico, managing the operations and marketing. Uh, and then they put me in charge uh, at it, in the largest merger in the history of the United States, Scott Paper Company, merged with Kimberly Clark. And that was an amazing learning experience. So truthfully, by the time that I was 40, I had climbed the ranks, was the youngest vice president at Kimberly Clark, and was kind of fat, dumb, and happy. I loved what I was doing. I loved the people I was with. And then knocking on the door was Kimberly Clark, or was Microsoft. And after several months of them knocking on the door and ultimately them sending my children an Xbox, uh -huh. um, my husband said, Jane, you either need to go talk to them or tell them to quit calling. So I went and talked to them. And about a month and a half later, I was walking through the door of Microsoft as a full-time employee. My kids were in a new school and I was in a new house across the, across the country. And from and I was hired as a corporate vice president, one of the most senior executives at Microsoft, uh, one of the top 150 people of a company of 100,000. So, <laughs> and your story is great, and the way you tell it in your book is uh, you just can't stop reading it. I read it during a, a plane flight uh, coming from uh, the United States all the way here, so it was awesome. Uh, I, I so enjoy the uh, story Definitely that you had to tell. Yeah. <laughs> So um, let's talk about why did you write this book? Well, the book is the book is called Worthy with the UN crossed off because a lot of the book is stories of overcoming the uns, feeling unworthy, unable, unempowered, unconfident, etc. It's not a book that says Jane Bulwer, follow her footsteps to go from the cornfields of Iowa to the corner office of Microsoft. Look how great she is. I wrote the book in a as a combination of a couple of things. One is I promised the people at Microsoft that I would write down my stories because I'm a storyteller. And they said, you really need to do this, capture your stories. And then the second thing is I made a decision of, in the process of writing my stories to not just talk about what I did, but how I felt, how I had to overcome in many cases. You know, I was born the fourth kid in a one bedroom house. I didn't have a lot of money and I didn't have kids, who, uh, parents who had expectations for me. So it was unlikely that I would leave my local community, much less achieve the career success that I did. And I wanted people to see not only what I achieved, but how I overcame the people who said I what I couldn't, wouldn't and shouldn't do. The circumstances that held me back and my own fear and feelings of unworthiness that occasionally held me back, often held me back. So that's why I wrote the book. I, well, I didn't find a book like it. I saw lots of rags to riches stories, some by women, but none that talked about overcoming um, some of the internal self-imposed limitations and challenges. So that's what I did. So you're one of five children. How did being part of such a large family impact you, which you mentioned honed at you, at, at least in your negotiating skills when you're with that many people? Got to be honest, Mark, I have to smile with that question because I grew up in rural Iowa, a local farming community. And in my town, five kids was not a lot. In fact, my best friend was one of 14 children, which was not unheard of. So our, our family was... Five kids was not a lot. We were five kids in six years. 
So when I was 25 years old, my mom had already had five, four kids and one on the way. But what, but the reality is we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have, you know, my dad laid carpeting for a living. He worked very, very hard, but we didn't have, and you could argue didn't have enough to go around. So there was a lot of negotiation that happened. Every now and again, for example, we would go out for burgers if there was a big occasion and you got $2 to spend on, on, on dinner which meant you couldn't afford the entire meal. So you had to kind of negotiate with your other brothers and sisters to get what you needed. And in the process of figuring out who to negotiate with at what point and who got to get what, really you learned to, to figure out how to move and get what you needed without hurting someone else and getting um, setting yourself up for success. And those skills absolutely transferred into the business world. Because if you negotiate and it's a win-lose, you're never going to get back to the table again. Somebody's going to do that once. And certainly within a family that's small and there's not enough to share or not enough for each individual, you learn pretty quickly how to make a little go a long way. Yeah, I, I thought that was really interesting when you talk about growing up with that many people and especially the economic circumstances. Your dad had his own business and, and he laid carpet. Was there anything you learned from him owning a business? Oh, Yeah. He left early and came back home late and he worked hard. It's interesting, Mark, because my kids work in an environment and lots of the people I know work in an environment where there's PTO, paid time off. And people take that for granted. I'm, I'm taking a PTO day. I'm PTO. <laughs> if you work in your own business, there's no paid time off. If you don't work, you don't make money. And if you have 500 kids, if you don't work, you don't feed your kids. And so one of the things that I learned is the give get and to be great, first of all, be grateful for the benefits that you receive in the companies that you work for. Um, and just not take it for granted. Not that you haven't earned them, but not to take them for granted. And also to respect and understand that people who have their own businesses are working very hard. They need the support. If you're going to rate someone, if you're going to support someone, I'm a huge supporter of small businesses because I appreciate and understand they're putting their lifeblood into it, their heart, their soul, um, their very best into it. And so to feed that passion, to feed and support that is to me pretty important. But I watched my dad work very hard. And to be honest with you, we did a lot of family projects that supported and worked with dad to help him along as well. It was a family uh, your, thing. Your dad. Your dad was a resourceful in terms of using objects around him to make other things <laughs> that the family could use. In what way did that influence the way you operate? I learned from a very young age that things that are used are still good. They can be repurposed. They can be made like new. Just because someone or something is discarded as irrelevant or dismissed, doesn't mean it can't come back in a second life. So my dad would take things from the side of the road. He would take pipes and make swing sets. He would take used bikes and make them like new again. He would find pieces and parts and put them together to solve problems that others didn't think could be happened. He laid carpeting, for example. He would take the scraps of carpeting and our basement was cold, but our house was small. So we used our basement and he would put the carpeting and glue it to the walls to make it warmer and more comfortable and kind of fun. So what I learned from him is that, and I still believe this today, just because someone or something has been dismissed or discarded doesn't mean that there's not usefulness in it. In fact, likely the opposite. That item, that person that's been discarded is gonna work harder, is going to have more relevance and is going to be more appreciated by given a second, third or fourth chance. I used to work for a guy named Pete Musser, who was the chairman and CEO of Safeguard Scientific, at that time, the largest publicly traded venture fund. And he used to collect broken toys, you know, mm. like former CEOs of companies that got discarded and give them all a second chance with his different ventures. And he was enormously successful because they were so grateful because if they mm. had a failure at that time, failure wasn't embraced like it is today as a learning Yes. Uh, opportunity back then you failed we're not hiring failures as as ceos yes. and but he collected them and, and those guys did exceedingly well and were incredibly uh loyal to him so 
it's good that you have that attitude, and especially learning that from your dad. How did going to Catholic school impact your view of life and the way you interacted with the world? You should talk a lot about that in the book. Well, going to Catholic school, my penmanship is fantastic. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the nuns ensured that. Um, actually, uh, for a small town, it was a given that you went to the private school, the, the Catholic school, because this, you know, where I grew up, it was mostly Catholic. And the discipline, the structure, in some cases, the religion, it provided a sense of community and a sense of belonging and a sense of right and wrong. It was also very structured. And for someone that's not structured like me, I um, there was a sense of merits and demerits, good and bad, left and right, right and wrong. And I was more of a shade of gray person sometimes. And so I got a lot of, I get into a lot of trouble or I got a lot of demerits. On the other hand, um, the community, the Catholic community, my family, et cetera, gave me a sense of, um, honestly, I we didn't have much money. You could argue we were poor growing up, but the community was so strong. We took care of one another and it was pretty foundational to my growing up that I felt that sense of belonging, felt that sense of um, together we can do what we can never do alone. And to this day, I'm very grateful for my Catholic upbringing. I don't practice that religion as, as sorry, mom, uh, because <laughs> there's a lot of things about that religion that no longer resonate with me, but I am very, very grateful for the upbringing that I had. What was it like, uh, and and you love doing this, you owned a horse with a very strong personality, which <laughs> matched yours based on what you wrote. What was that like uh, owning a horse? Because your dad uh, helped you, your dad and your grandfather helped you find that horse. Uh, what was it like owning a horse and how did that also shape you? I was very young. I was in the fifth grade, fourth or fifth grade when I told my dad I was buying a horse. And keep in mind, I started at a very young age earning money through a lot of different jobs and it had raised $200, mostly by dollar at a time to buy a horse. And I told my dad I was doing that and he laughed at me and I was serious. And eventually he understood I was serious. And he and my grandfather went and looked for horses for me in the community. And the one that they bought truthfully was the one my dad wanted. He was very big. He was very strong headed. And truthfully, nobody else really wanted this horse. It was probably a horse that should have gone for a lot more money, but it was mean and nobody else wanted it. So the farmer, I think, said, take it. And I was so desperate to have a horse and to have something I loved that I just kept at it. I climbed a fence to get on him. I fed him and everything that I could. <laughs> I, I sang to him. I did everything I could. And that horse bucked everybody off of him except me. And in time, we formed a mutual friendship where the I think the love and the corn and everything that I gave him overcame his meanness, to be truthful. And he became a fabulous friend. He became everything that I could have wanted in a horse. But he was most definitely not a horse you would call Sugar or Dolly or anything like that. <laughs> his name was Buster. And he did not appreciate being ridden by a, a young child at first. But it took me about six months to a year before I could even ride the horse without him trying to even even listening to me. And what I've learned from that is that a lot of times kindness, patience um, and knowing, you know, my dad would tell me, Jane, show that horse who's boss, kick him in the in the side, <laughs> you know, don't let him get away with that. Well, I wasn't confused who was in charge. The horse was in charge. I was a little girl. But we found a mutual understanding. And I think sometimes people go into business and they think their title makes them someone that is in charge and their experience or their, you know, they, they use positional authority for other people to try to bully their way forward. It doesn't work. And I learned that with my horse, that you have to find out what each one gives and find that, that mutual ground for being successful and you have to be willing to take a risk and to put yourself out there. For me, I couldn't even saddle the horse by myself until I climbed on a fence. And I had to be willing to do something out of the ordinary to become friends with this, with this animal, with this horse in order to be able to ride it. And I think that transferred into my business experience as well. 
What did you learn from your dad who kept kicking that horse in the side until the horse bucked him off? Yeah. Well, that was my dad. And honestly, what I learned is just what I said. You cannot use positional authority. You cannot force something, especially if it's bigger. You cannot force your way of doing things on someone else if they don't want to take it. And in, whether it's overt or in overt, they are going to push back and they're not going to do it. And my dad often tried to use force to make things happen. And he, the horse bucked him off and dad never got back on the horse again because he wouldn't let him. And you know, it actually made sense because your dad had always used his hands and he controlled everything by fear, uh, by sheer physical force, right? Yeah. Carpeting yeah. everything. Sure. So why sh why shouldn't the horse be the same? Or, well, it's just a know. dumb horse. You just got to show yeah. the boss. You think about right. the thing often. Yeah. It doesn't always work. Yeah. Uh, one of your early bit, uh, business lessons was having a crew that detasseled corn and one of your crew wanted to quit, but you persuaded him to stay. How did you do it? And what did you learn from that? Well, first of all, detasseling corn is taking the top off of tassels in very hot weather, very steamy, nasty. It's a nasty, nasty, hard job. And I had a crew of people that would go into the field with me in the morning into tassel corn. And I got paid really well, and I was the crew leader. And if my crew left me, or if a couple of people left me, I wouldn't be able to finish the job on time and get the bonus. And I needed that money to survive, to get to college, to do to support myself. And so when someone that was key, a best friend, came to me and said, I cannot do it anymore. Blisters on my shoulders. I am tired. I don't want to do this anymore. And the truth was, I understood her. She didn't want to do it anymore. She didn't have to do it anymore. Her parents had money. She wasn't dependent on this job for survival, but I was. I tried everything to, to negotiate with her to come back the next day. And she wouldn't hear of it. She absolutely was like, no, I'm not doing it. I just wanted to let you know. And finally, I had to say, Tweedle, Marita, please come back. Not for yourself, but if you don't come back, I can't finish the job. I can't get paid. I can't do what I need to do to make the money that I need to go to school, to buy clothes, et cetera. Will you come back for me? And she looked at me and she said, I will come back for you. Yes. And that's when in my mind, I realized that people work for more than a job. They work for the team, they work for the leader, they work for the person, they work for the sense of community. And in the process of her saying yes, her sister also came back and her sister influenced the others and everyone came back. And together we finished the job ahead of schedule, bonus earned, uh, lesson learned. <laughs> but it literally was a matter of me, again, being vulnerable at a time when I didn't want to be vulnerable. I didn't want to share that I needed her help. I had always expected that the way to move forward was rely on yourself, do it yourself. If it needs to get done, you have to do it. No one can say, succeed by themselves. I had to say your whole um, upbringing and life all the way through to you, you got to college was its own mini MBA program. Hence why I've been going through these different things that you learned that I th actually think set you up for success uh, down the road. I mean, you worked in a restaurant while attending Iowa State University and you worked for a cheap owner <sighs> and you wrote, uh, it doesn't, uh, uh, you wrote, it doesn't pay not to pay. What do you mean by that? <laughs> I genuinely believe it doesn't pay not to pay. If you know that you are paying someone below their worth and they know it as well, and they feel as though you are taking advantage of them, you're, in, you're screwed because they are going to find a way to get their value or they're going to leave. In the case for me, it was a restaurant and the person was inviting me to come in early and pay me not enough money to do the work, like you know, sweep the floors, wash, the, wash things, et cetera. And the way that we, that was true of the entire employees, we helped ourselves to the food that we would otherwise have paid for. We helped ourselves to an occasional steak or mm -hmm. we did other things. And in the end, the person ended up paying us our worth in different ways. And the difference was that we felt bad. We felt badly about our, our employer 
because she was saying, I don't value you. In the end, she ended up paying us the equivalent no matter what. The difference is we would have gladly done the work had she been at least acknowledged us and said, we'll pay you for that. And we would have gone over and above for her, but that didn't happen. So it doesn't pay not to pay. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, your parents worked hard, but with five kids didn't have much as you've talked about during the show here. <clears throat> and you put yourself through school. Do you think all parents should do uh, make their kids uh, pay their own way through school to make them more self-reliant? I mean, now that you reflect on it, and I don't remember if you mentioned whether you put your own kids through school. We, um, that's a really good question. My husband and I, I married my high school sweetheart from the same hometown that I was at. And we worked our way up to have money and said, do what do we want our kids? Do we want to pay for our kids' college education? And our kids did get jobs in college. And I do believe that a strong work ethic can be for school. It can be a job, but they have to be able to be in a scenario where they appreciate the work that you're paying for school. For us, we told our kids, you pick the school you want to go to. We will pay your college education, but that is your inheritance. We believe in you, go to the school you want, get the degree that you want. And from there, we believe that you will make the career and make the life for yourself that you, um, that you, uh, that will carry you forward. And so do I believe that kids should um, be responsible and have a piece, be responsible for a portion of their education? I do, I do. But I also think for me, it was, um, we went a step further and said, this is, uh, we're gonna we're gonna give this to you, but this is for you to carry forward on your own. We, we, we have confidence you'll do that. Um, please talk about your college carpet business and selling your mom's prayers and all the things you learned from that. That was pretty amazing uh, what you're able to do with those two things. Well, I went to college and I did pay 100% of my college education, which meant I went to school full time and I had four part time jobs. <clears throat> Even so, I did not have enough money. So one day I was in a coll my college dorm room and we were all complaining about the floor because it was a tile floor and it was freezing cold. It was just freezing cold. And we never were warm enough. And someone said, gosh, if only these floors were carpeted, why is there no carpet on this floor? And I thought of my dad and how he had all these remnants of carpet in his garage. He would save the remnants of carpet from his work and then eventually he would take them to the dump. And I thought, ah, oh, I... I'm going to get dad's remnants, put them together into rugs and sell the rugs to my college, to my, to the people at the college. But the tricky part was as I drove home, <clears throat> I didn't know how to ask my dad. Cause I, in my family, you could do something without permission. You could, um, you know, you could ask to help someone, but you never asked for help yourself. And so I had to overcome my own anxiety, my own fear, and ask my dad to help me. And he taught me how to seam together carpet pieces that I then went back to college with in the back of my car. And from the back of my car, I sold remnants of carpets, rags, and for like $100 a piece. And they went gangbusters. People loved them. And so from there, honestly, I raised enough money in part to pay for my tuition. And what I learned again was that those remnants, those rags of carpets, those scraps of carpet, when they came together in a new way, were able to be sold by me and finance what was my college education. That's one story. The second story is how I sold my mom's prayers. Um, sorry, mom. She's not. She's not. <laughs> My mom's very Catholic. She used to get up at like four and five in the morning to start praying, and she always had a list of people she prayed for. And when friends of mine and myself would have a big exam, she'd, they'd say, hey, would Madonna Bernadette pray for me for my exam? And I'd say, sure. And I'd call mom and I'd say, hey, mom, I got a big exam coming up. Katie's got a big exam coming up. Joni's got a big com exam coming up. Will you pray for us? And she'd say, sure. Well, word of mom's prayer started to spread. And people I didn't know asked for Madonna Bernadette, my mom, to pray for them. And it may sound terrible, but I thought, well... I need the money. They need the prayers. Mom's going to pray anyway. 
And so I started to sell and say for $10, my mom will pray for your exam. But for $20, she'll put a votive candle on the stove and <laughs> for video. So it's up to you. If you want a votive candle, it'll last the whole day, no matter how many exams you have, but it's up to you. And so slowly but surely, my mom, I used to make her write down the names because I didn't want to be responsible for people flunking. And she would pray for my friends and the people who were paying me to do well in their exams. And I'm not saying there was a direct correlation, but I would say that I had a lot of repeat customers. So um, I made money selling my mom's prayers. She said lots of prayers for people and everybody was happy. You were the queen of side hustle. That's for sure. I didn't and, have a choice. And, and I also think that um, mentally because of the prayers, they just did better because it, it, gave them that extra boost right absolutely that confidence that little something to get over the hustle you know whether they were writing a, a, a paper and were stuck or they were anxious about going into an exam and then felt more calm whatever it was it was just enough to get them to be their best uh strange um, um, a microsoft top executive like yourself would have a forestry degree why did you choose that major <laughs> i chose forestry because when I was a senior in high school, um, a gnarly old nun, she was about four foot nothing. She had lightning bolts coming out of her eyes, spoke with absolute passion and conviction, pulled me aside one day after school or after a class and said, Jane, what are you doing after, after you graduate? And I said, I don't know, but I'm not sticking around. I'm going, I'm going somewhere. She says, you need to go to college. I'm like, okay. And she says, what do you like? And I told her about how I like the outdoors and et cetera. And she says, you need to go to school for forestry. And I, okay, that sounds pretty good. Now keep in mind, this is Iowa, which has like a dozen trees in it, right? But I went to school for forestry because she said, you should do this. And she went a step further. She helped me to get a college scholarship. It was only a $320 scholarship that I applied for and earned, but it said everything to me. It opened the world up to me. It said, someone thinks that I, Jane Bulware, fourth of five kids in a community or in a family that doesn't believe in college should go to college. And I went and my world opened up and changed. I didn't know what existed until I went to college and started to meet different people. And that's why I'm donating hundred percent of my proceeds from this book for scholarships for Boys and Girls Club, because if it weren't for that $320 scholarship and that gnarly old nun who opened a door for me, I'd probably still work and be working at the Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> so, the Piggly Wiggly, I haven't heard that in a while. So that's, I mean, that's why people are like, why did you, why are you pick Boys and Girls Club? Why are you giving away the proceeds to your book? Um, because I've made enough for my family and myself. And I am going to be devoting the rest of my life to be able to make an open doors for other people to the best of my ability. And that's part of why I wrote the book too, is to help people overcome the things that get in their way that limit their success, that limit their ability to move forward effectively. So that's why I wrote the book. That's why I'm donating the proceeds from the book. Um, after you went to Iowa State, you got into Purdue and you went into the MBA program and focused on marketing. Talk about how that changed your life. In truth, I went into the MBA program with a specialization in forestry, industrial forestry. And it was a forestry professor who said after class again one day, Jane, you really seem to have an aptitude for marketing. Why are you in industrial forestry? To which the answer was, I have a scholarship. <laughs> and my yeah. husband and I are going to school for free or just about free. And he took a step forward and he found a different um, scholarship for both me and my husband to be able to switch gears. I loved marketing. Loved, I love business. I love building business. I love building people because it is literally connecting opportunity and need with something that solves a problem. And I have felt like I had done that my entire life. And I went to work and pursued a company called Kimberly Clark, which makes consumer packaged goods products, Kleenex and Huggies and Kotex and Depend and Scott Paper, et cetera. 
because it was consumer packaged good and marketing, but it was also forestry. They owned thousands, tens of thousands, millions of acres of timber. And I loved that it was the combination of both and it felt right for me. The problem was they didn't interview marketing people at Purdue. So I had to pretend to be an engineer and I went to with the inter where they interviewed engineers at Purdue and I listened. And then after everybody else had gone, I went to the recruiter and I said, I really want to work for your company. And he said, well, that's great. What's your engineering degree? And I said, marketing. And he said, we don't recruit for MBA marketers for, from Purdue. And I said, well, how about you have coffee with me and I'll tell you why you should. And in the process of doing that, we he opened the door and I walked through it. And 17 years later, I was one of the senior, I was the senior marketing person at the entire company. Worked out you, you started, as you mentioned, your career, Kimberly Clark, and immediately you met a jackass named Kent. Now I don't know if that's a, a, a name you just <laughs> happened to give this guy who came from a top school and whose skill was pumping himself up and putting others down. Yep. What, what did you learn about how to handle the Kents of this world? I did meet Kents. And throughout the book, every guy, every time I meet a jackass, as you say, I call him a Kent because I think we all have Kents in our life. And they're not so much, they're not so much interested in pumping themselves up as they are in bringing you down. And there's a big difference. Like I, I know the difference between someone who's like, you do well for a woman. It's a sincere compliment. They genuinely mean that. It's not a put down. They mean that. Or they say something that you could infer is a, is a put down, but Kent's literally try to step on you and bring you down in the process of making themselves feel better. And I learned to look out for those guys. I learned to protect my team from those guys. And at the end of the day, I learned that their comments was not about me. It was about them. And if they're putting me down, they're putting everybody down. They're putting the guys down. They're putting the women down. They're just part of that chest pumping, nudge, nudge, wink, wink club guys that are putting other people down and are not about anyone but themselves. And they're, you know, they will only advance so far. But when I first started at Kimberly Clark, I felt like a pig farmer from Iowa because I was <laughs> And I felt like I had gotten into MBA by the back door because I did. And I felt like I'd gotten my degree from the back door because I did. And I was working in a, a job that required three to four to five to six years of experience, which I didn't have. And I thought, oh my gosh, they're going to find out that I'm not qualified. They're going to find out I'm not good enough. They're going to, the more they get to know me, they're going to realize that I'm a fake. And so it really bothered me. I really let Kent get under my skin. I really struggled to appreciate what I uniquely brought to the, to the party. And <clears throat> it took a lot for me to realize and to have some successes at Kimberly Clark and, um, to overcome my own uns, my own sense of unworthiness, my own sense of uncapability, et cetera. It also took for every Kent, there's a Dudley. And I talk about the Dudleys in my in my Yeah, life. that's my next question is about Dudley. But Dudley before we hit before we okay. hit Dudley, I, I want to know that when you started to evaluate people that you brought on your team, how does someone see, uh so sis out uh, a future Kent, you know, when you're interviewing people, how do you know if you're going to get a Kent or not? What kind of questions can you ask to, uh, to see, you know, what you're truly getting with the people that you're hiring? There's that fine line, right? Because people want to put their best foot forward. So they want to pump themselves up or they want to be, you know, they want to say what they're really good at. But if all someone does is talk about themselves and talk about what they do, and they never talk about the impact of others, and when you, and in the process of doing that, talk about how their success was forged by working together as a team or by what they did and what other people delivered to it is always suspect. A question I always look for when I'm interviewing is at the end of the interview, when someone asks the question, what didn't I ask that I should have? Or what don't you see in me 
that maybe um, causes you concern. Because what that says to me is that they recognize that they're not just selling themselves, but they're also trying to find a win-win. Because it doesn't do anyone any good to apply for a job and just get a job if truly they don't have the right skills. Both will fail. Both yep. will fail. So having that self-understanding about what's being looked for in the role and asking that question honestly in the interview versus they're going to talk about it afterwards anyway with their peers what they thought was good about you, et cetera. You might as well have that conversation with the person. And if they don't have the self-awareness to ask those meaningful questions about what they aren't, as, or to say what they aren't as well as what they are, yeah, nobody's the full meal deal. Nobody has all the skills. You have to figure out what you bring and appreciate what others need to, to, to supplement. So let's go the opposite direction with Dudley. Yeah. Talk about Dudley. Well, I showed up. Um, I showed up my, one of my first days in the office. I hadn't even found the coffee pot yet. And this guy with a lollipop folds his lanky body into the tiny chair in my tiny office and asks me questions about myself. You know, who I am, where I'm from, if I, do I have a family, et cetera. And he just seemed genuinely interested. And after a while, I said, boy, I'm really glad you're here really glad you're here. I think you're going to make a, I think you're going to do really well here. I'm glad you're on our team. I, you know, I look forward to working with you. And then he left my office and I watched him walk away past my off, past my, my boss's office, past my boss's boss's office and into the corner office. He was the head honcho mm -hmm. and he was really just a genuinely, truly nice individual seeking to understand who and what I was about. And he never forgot the answers I told him. He remembered the names of my of my husband. He remembered, you know, where I was from. And whenever I met with him, he never, I never felt like I was more than or less than. I had to earn my stripes, but he was very clear. He's like, Jane, you talk too much. I need you to be more succinct. If you don't know an answer, it's okay. Just tell me you don't know an answer. And you need to frame your thoughts. Background, recommendation, rationale, next steps, timing. Just think of those things. Basically taught me how to do a two-minute elevator speech and then to listen for the questions coming out. It's like, you don't have to prove yourself every time you're with me. I hired you, you were hired, so you're capable. You don't know everything, you're learning, and that's okay. The only way you're going to learn is to listen and share what you believe and discern and other people will discern and take that as part of what the business needs. You are not here to save the business. You're not here to do any of those things. Just be part of our team. It's okay. And being so real and giving me permission to be vulnerable, giving me permission to learn, giving me permission to frame my thoughts, background, recommendation, rationale, um, timing, next step, cost was invaluable to me and enabled me to overcome the Kents who felt like they had to show themselves every time and pump themselves up and bring someone else down every time. You never, never, never win by bringing someone else down. I just don't believe that I, my success comes at the expense of someone else. I don't believe it. I've never felt that way. And if I were to feel that way, it would tell me that I'm not good enough for my role if I have to do it at the expense of someone else. I just believe What that. made Kimberly Clark's culture so appealing to you? And how did a guy like Kent even get recruited? Well, you look at Kent's resume, it was really, he'd done great things. It's not that he wasn't smart or that he wasn't accomplished or any of those things. He was just so insecure, honestly, that he, um, you know, and he started working for a guy that just was more like him than not. But I was fortunate to work in an organization forged by Dudley that um, the truth is you take a culture comes from its leadership. I learned that certainly at Kimberly Clark, and I certainly learned that at Microsoft. The culture comes from its leader and Dudley's leadership was such that you brought your best and it was okay to make mistakes. And I loved that culture. And that's when I interviewed, I interviewed at Procter & Gamble. I had a job at Procter, I had a job offer at Procter & Gamble. In fact, they said, 
you have a job offer at Kimberly Clark, but we've given you a job offer. Why would you work for Kimberly Clark when we've given you a job offer? That's a no brainer. Come work for us. And the way they handled that was the reason why I went with Kimberly Clark. They were very arrogant and I don't, having come from what I came from, I didn't have room in my life for arrogance. Which was pretty surprising since they're a Midwestern, uh, Midwest uh, company as well with Midwest values, right? And all of their brands are number one. I mean, they really do amazing things to be sure. But it was interesting because, <clears throat> and this is not anything against Ivy League. I know you're Ivy League with Wharton and we hired people from Wharton. But for Kim for Kimberly Clark, we realized once we, st we stopped hiring at some of the Ivy League schools, because those people were about their own success and were about their own intelligence and their own ability to make things happen. And sometimes when you hire people that have had circumstances or maybe a second tier school or someone that maybe has experienced failure, they'll try harder, they'll work harder. They will use that experience of having to grind and bring that forward. And I think that's that's what happened with me versus Kent. I Maybe I was a grinder. Maybe I worked my way up and I, 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 like I said, I didn't have room for arrogance. It's hard to be arrogant when you're from the cornfields of Iowa. Yeah, I agree with totally of just what you just said. Um, you learned how David could uh, beat Goliath when Clembury Clark's Huggies dethroned PNG's Pampers. What did you learn and how did that frame your thinking for future mismatches? Oh boy. And that applied very much to Microsoft. We were... Nina, Wisconsin is not exactly the hub of the world. And we, Huggies was number two. And Pampers clearly was number one globally. But we had, we listened to our customers. We applied the learning to our customers to better products. And our budgets were less than half of Procter & Gamble's Pampers, less than half. So we had to be smarter. We had to be more nimble. We had to be more humble in our marketing. We would do like 27 versions of, of direct mails to figure out which one worked better. We had to do like go into hospitals and actually talk to people and get distribution by, by making eye to eye contact sometimes. We had to do things that the number one brand didn't have to do. And slowly but surely we etched our way up the market share. And I think Procter & Gamble looked at us gaining market share and frankly didn't take us very seriously because we were Hicks, cheeseheads in Wisconsin. But we itched our way up and kept doing what worked and kept gaining loyalty and kept doing the right things and kept out innovating them until in fact we were number one. And when we became number one, it was fantastic. We were like, Whoa. and then we went back to our offices and we went back to work. We got a nice handwritten note from the CEO. We went out for pizza and beer, but there were no like big celebrations. There was no, you know, sales trips to Hawaii or Jakarta or anything like that to celebrate. We just kept doing what we were doing because that's how you win. At least that's how we won. And the Wall Street Journal wrote articles. Um, I was interviewed, we were interviewed by the Harvard Business Review, and there were white papers that were written and colleges did studies on it. And I'd like to say it was one big idea that there was that we won. It wasn't. It was literally connecting with the consumer, keep trying new things, keep learning from what we did, and being smarter because we literally spent a fraction of what the big boys did. And once they realized that we'd usurped them, they just threw money at us. But by that point, we'd established the relationships with the retailers, with the consumers, et cetera, and we stayed number one. This is not cool. a business question, but I'm just curious about this. Throughout the book, you mentioned the impact John Denver's music had on you, <laughs> uh, which you rarely ever hear of John Denver being played no. uh, at all, which is, um, you know, when you and I are similar age, he was huge, he uh, John Denver. Okay. What was the, why did you fall in love with John Denver's music? Uh, and, and what did that mean to you? Gosh, that's a great question. I grew up from a very young age, I started to work. And my parents, my world was very, very small. It was my town and my, even my block, my neighborhood and my family. 
And when I heard John's, John Denver's music and he started to write about mountains and Rocky Mountains High, I'd never seen the mountains. I'd never seen the oceans. I'd never seen a forest. And the music resonated with me because it enabled me for the first time in my life to dream about something beyond what I lived. And it took me to a place that I did not beyond what I knew. And I started to imagine a world different than what I had. And I still listen to John Denver sometimes because it takes me to a place that enables me to dream. And that's what John Denver um, represented to me. It represented a dream of something different, better, um, that I had never experienced before. And in part, that's why I went to forestry, because I wanted an avenue to that dream. And I live now in the Seattle, and I'm in the mountains, and I'm hiking um, many Listening days. to John Denver. And I do still listen to John Denver. It's true. I, I actually met him uh, my sophomore year of college uh, because he opened up our new stadium at West Virginia University because of his mm -hmm. songs. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I got to meet him a cup for just a couple minutes um, in the press box. So uh -huh. it was pretty cool because he was such a, an enormous star that's totally forgotten by any generation but after us. Or made a joke of, I don't understand it. But, you know, I never saw him in concert because it turns out he doesn't come to Iowa. Uh, a lot of people <laughs> didn't at that time anyway. But still, um, what an influence he had on me. Really, truly. Um, you talked about the difficulty of being a mom and realizing you can't have it all. Uh, please talk about that because I think your perspective, regardless of motherhood, relationships or work, would be good to hear because I think it can elevate self-induced pressure. I, um, you know, 30 years ago, I was an unconventional leader and woman, to be sure. There were not a lot of other women in the workplace. And when I first got married, truthfully, there were three things that I said I was going to do when I was young. I was going to leave Iowa and have a life different than what I knew. Check. I was never getting married. Got married uh -huh. 21. Uh -huh. And then I swore that I would never have children because I didn't want to be what I, what I grew up with. I didn't know a lot of people that were super happy with it was not in, it was, it, it, it did not, um, it was not part of what I thought was uh, aligned with happiness. So after 10 years of marriage, I did become pregnant and I was in a position where I was a senior person at Microsoft. And I was asked many times, are you going to come back to work? Are you going to come back to work? Because many women at that time did not go back to the office, did not go back to work. And I noticed that I was being treated differently. I was being dismissed in some things. <clears throat> and there were not other women in my scenario generally. And I never had a doubt that I would go back to work. I never had a doubt after the baby was born, my son, whom I adore, my first son had several children. Um, I realized that I was going to be a better mom by working because I loved what I did and that I would not be a good stay at home mother. And that those around me who questioned that or who judged that or who um, didn't understand that at first made me feel really bad about myself. And I started to say, I need to have my own yardstick for success. Um, and my yardstick for success, if I'm going to be, it is having a happy family, having a happy husband, being good at my job, all of those things. I can't do that as a stay at home mom. And so what I did is what I'd done throughout my entire life. I found others around me who wanted to take care of my child, who wanted to be a stay-at-home mom, but couldn't afford it without my child. So um, they, my neighbor ended up taking care of during the day my child. But the stress of, of having to juggle that um, was significant, was significant. Not my husband didn't feel that way. He worked evenings and weekends in retail. He loved it. Um, but I, I really, I did struggle trying to do it all until the point came where ultimately I said to my husband, we have to change. Something has to change because I'm working a lot of hours. I'm doing all of these things. Um, something has to give. And he ended up ultimately becoming a stay at home dad, which was phenomenal, uh, so that we could, 
I, we could have the lifestyle and the family that we chose and wanted, and I could continue in my path. And I even took a job in South America um, where I commuted to South America and he lived in Atlanta with my son and I commuted every week. Um, and, you know, keep in mind at that time, there were no men that really lit, took care of the kids. Very few. The welcome yeah. wagon came to our front door when we were in Atlanta and he opened the door and they were like, where's your wife? And he says, she's in uh, Bogota. Yeah. And they said, well, what are you, you know, they didn't know what to think. So they, they brought a cake to welcome us to the neighborhood and they left with the cake. <laughs> we didn't know what to do with him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we had to define our own path as unconventional as it was because the traditional path was just not going to, the traditional path wasn't going to work for me um, and it wasn't going to work for him. And the more that I tried to fit into a, a square hole and a round peg, uh, the unhappier both of us, all of us were. And I had to fundamentally say, my marriage is strong. My kids are happy. And I'm happy with what I do. This is our life. It may not fit others, but it, it works. And that's what the approach I took. Well, what's, what's the coaching you give the women who have worked for you in the past to help them balance that all out? Because I think there's a big push and pull about God, I'm a crappy mom if I oh. can't be there for my kids. At the same time, they have the same ambition as the guys do uh, to maximize their potential and get as far as they can get. So what have you been coaching young women? Uh, it's a great question. There's a study done by um, Harvard Business uh, School and by the McKinsey Group. And in both studies, what they find is two things. Number one, women tend to under promote themselves in the same job. So they'll do the same job as a man, but the way they describe their role, the way they describe what they achieve is less than what they actually contribute. And men typically promote more than what they contribute. The second study, the one done by um, McKinsey shows that women who typically perform better in a similar job, but are promoted 14% less likely, less often than men's in a similar job. Both of those things I find are related because they have to do with a woman recognizing her worth, standing up and claiming the performance that she does and accepting that their yardstick for success, that their, their, their threshold is unreasonably high. They cannot and should not do it all by themselves. And really demanding, if you will, or requiring to be recognized and to sharing that accountability with their husband, with their community, with others, and saying, that's okay. It is okay to be successful. It is okay to be struggling in a job or to be stretching in a job. And it's okay not to have the cookies and the cupcakes at the football game, like some of the other moms or other people do. But you first and foremost have to be okay with that with yourself. And so sometimes all I do is hold a mirror up to the person and show them all of the things that they're doing and they're doing well and saying, take a breath, own this, own what you're doing and stop thinking about the things that you're not doing because your children, assuming you're spending the important time with them, see that you're happy, see that you're you're prioritizing them, see that you're working hard. And that's what they take away. My children, I never told my children. I, I would tell my children when I brought them to school and other moms would be crying because their kids would be going to school and they were sad and the kids would be hanging onto their legs. My kids didn't do that. I would say, I get to go to work and, and work with my friends. You get to go to school and be with your friends. And tonight when we get home, we're going to talk about our day and all the cool stuff we learned. And they thought that that was, and that was normal for us. I came home happy. They came home happy. And we talked about our day in a positive way. And please don't I make it sound like I was happy every day and I had it all figured out. There were, I was a hot mess a lot. I was a hot mess a lot. Um, trying to do it all and crying like, oh my God, I'm in over my head. 
one of the things that took me a long time to learn is I thought it wasn't okay that I was so afraid. I kept taking jobs that were a stretch. Working in South America as a white woman who didn't speak Spanish, who had a one and a half year old kid, it was a huge stretch. Working on a, on a, on a merger with unions and all this stuff that was a mess, huge stretch. And I was so afraid I was gonna muck it up. And I tried so hard to hide that. And it took me a long time to realize that I'm afraid because I'm stretching. And that if I wasn't stretching, I probably wouldn't be afraid. And there's a big difference between being afraid because I'm gonna injure myself or I'm in danger and being afraid because I'm stretching and I'm growing and I don't know what I'm doing and I'm feeling like I'm out of my element. In that scenario, you can fix that with roll aids. <laughs> right? And I had to, it took me a while to realize it's okay not to know. It's okay to be afraid, ask for help and be a part of a solution, not feeling like you have to be the only solution. Um, you had a difficult time of getting Microsoft to understand that they um, had to make consumers happy by providing easy to use and understanding, uh, understand the products and fitting into the culture. Uh, and you had a, uh, you know, and you yourself had to try to fit into this uh, technology focused culture. How did you make your case and, and, and what can we learn from it? I went from a culture that was very much focused on external, very much focused on doing what was right for the consumer, being creating products that met consumer demand and being very much focused on that. And what was done internally was done to achieve that. Microsoft's culture was very different at that time. It was about eating their young and protecting their silos. So their products weren't so much informed by consumers as informed by developers for consumers or for users, as I was told. We didn't, there weren't consumers, there were users, according to Bill and Steve and others. And People were more interested in protecting their silos, product A, product B, brand A, brand B, brand C, brand D. You'd have four brands for the same product and they were all competing internally. And so I tried to unravel that and it put together a plan to show how to bring those brands together, how to do it in a way that would align and, 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 um, and be valued by the consumer and meet consumer needs. What I didn't realize was that the culture of the company at that time, eating its young, would not work with what I was presenting. And so there were two choices that I had. One was to adapt to a culture and play by their rules, or this three, three choices actually. The second was to leave, which is what most of the people at my level did. Or the third was to find a niche in the company where I could manage based on what I knew was had been successful in the past. Unfortunately, I chose to try to adapt and become like the people at Microsoft at that time. And you could have just as well dipped me in chocolate and eaten me alive because it did not work. I got absolutely, I, I was so not successful um, because I didn't have a technology background and so on. So what I would tell people is that if you're going to adapt your style, your values, your who you are to fit into a company culture, it's not likely to work. And even if it does work, you're not likely to be happy. If you need to leave, leave. It's not failure. And if you are able to find a niche where you can be authentic and be your authentic self, do it but know that you better have a moat around yourself or find yourself in a scenario where you can protect that and your people. Um, I'm someone that doesn't give up easily, which is why I stayed. And sometimes staying is not a good idea. It's not failing to leave. Yeah, I, I, um, I had students at Wharton at the same time that you were there and they described it exactly as you did, especially the siloed, some of the call them warlords and that it was a totally dysfunctional place to work compared to Apple 
and some of the other uh, companies. Uh, mm -hmm. Steve Bomber has been a case study of how not to run a company that was in the Harvard uh, Business Review. Is that fair? And what did you learn from working for him? Uh, because he was the CEO at the time you were there. Yeah. I think it's important to differentiate between the person Steve Ballmer and the leadership Steve Ballmer. I think the person Steve Ballmer was generally well-intentioned, is a good guy. He certainly helped us out at the Boys and Girls Club, et cetera. But his style was literally to throw brilliant minds together and let them duke it out for the best idea. And he, you could argue Microsoft changed the world. They absolutely did. And they wanted to change the world. They wanted to do right by the world. They do amazing things for the world. But his leadership style pitted people against each other and kept the focus internal. And I would argue that as a result of that, we missed many significant things happening in the industry, whether it was the you know search, it was music online, the cloud, a number of things. And I believe that if the culture had been more collaborative, where we built upon each other, those brilliant minds would have genuinely changed the world faster, better, differently than what happened. And I think Microsoft lost its footing and lost a lot of brain power and opportunity, much opportunity during the time that that was the case. Yeah, that's what Harvard happened calls it the lost years. decade. They the call lost, it the lost it, it, decade. It really, really was. And I would be in meetings genuinely in offsites with Steve and Bill and others. And it was like, who could outsmart or out? It was the, it was bizarre, honestly, how people related to each other. I went to Steve Ballmer's house for a barbecue and I was relatively new and I was introducing myself to people and they're like, who are you again? Where do you work? And they uh -huh. literally wouldn't wouldn't shake my hand. They're like, if you're here in an, in an if you're here next year, come and introduce yourself. Then it was so not about moving the business forward and meeting consumers' needs, which is what I was brought in brought in to do. That I don't know that anyone could have been successful in that scenario. Uh, but the new CEO, not so new anymore, has done exactly the opposite. Exactly. You know, and, yeah, yeah. and I guarantee he's no smarter than, than Steve or Bill or any of those guys. But what he's done is he's basically said, we will get, we're going to focus on fewer things and we're going to be successful by working together on those things. And if you're not able to do that, and if you're not able or wanting to do that, well, sorry, that's probably not the place for you. I hate to say this because I haven't validated it, but I did read <clears throat> If you invested money under Steve, if you invested $1,000 with Steve Ballmer when he first became CEO, it was worth less than $1,000 when, when he left. And right. And if you invested $1,000 with Satya, it now would be worth $10,000. I think that's the impact a CEO can have on the company. Truly. Brilliant people. And as a leader for your organization, if you are not telling people that they're going to be successful by working together and across common goals that are clearly understood, and you're not rewarding people by how they su uh, achieve success by working together, and you're not removing their barriers to success, including yourself, you will not be achieving your full potential or even successful probably. That's Jane, I wanna say this was a very quick hour. So enjoyed reading the book and listening to you talk about your story. And I think uh, everybody from uh, mm -hmm. the, from uh, what we're seeing here has thought it was a great hour well worth spending with you. So again, thank you so much. We wish you luck with the book. Thank and you. uh, hopefully you'll write another book because I think there's another book inside you uh, that could come out. And I wanted to say to everyone, have a wonderful weekend. And we'll look forward to seeing you all next Friday. Thank you. And do please write, please uh, buy the book, the proceeds, all the proceeds go to charity for scholarships. So even if you don't like the book, move the peanut forward for someone else. I'd really appreciate it. And write a review because I don't have a marketing budget and you're my marketing. So thank you. So much. One thank you so much. Everyone have a wonderful weekend. Thank you everybody for coming. Can in. I just ask one question?